Welcome everybody to our second Andy Cook uh, Memorial event. So this is our series created in memory of Dr. Andy Cook, who is a physician dedicating his career to providing and improving care for behavioral health services for children, adolescents, and their families. I think in his memory, this, this is such a challenging topic, it's such a challenging thing that we're all facing in our practice, new challenges every day. So the opportunity to learn from experts and, and have ideas about how we can do our best in caring for these kids is such a beneficial opportunity. So thank you for taking the time to be here. I, I'd like to introduce Dr. Robbins. Uh, Dr. Robbins is a long-standing clinician in our area and um, actually did his training in Minnesota, if I, if I read that correctly. Some of it, <laughs> yes. But Dr. Robbins having long experience in, in this area, I'm, I'm thrilled to have him speaking with us this morning and I look forward to, to hearing it. I, I look forward to reviewing it later. Again, thanks everyone for coming and Dr. Robbins, please. Thank you. Thanks. Well, good morning. It really is a uh, privilege and a pleasure to be here and I just want to start by saying uh, a word about Andy Cook. I knew Andy and long before I came to Maine, which was in 96, over the phone, I had seen an ad. We, had, we, had, we like a million other people in the world, had enjoyed vacationing in Maine and uh, thought, oh, boy, that, well, that, that's the place we ought to live. You know? And I'd seen an ad for Shoreline Mental Health uh, and his name was the contact guy. And I called up and we talked quite, for qu quite a bit it wasn't really the job for me. I was at the University of Michigan at that point and, and that and kind of needed to develop in a in a university center and so that so I didn't come. But uh, but I kinda knew who Andy was and kept in touch and saw him at some meetings and he he was a, a uh, first and foremost a, a dedicated and exemplary physician. He just really cared about his patients. Uh, cared about the, the systems issues that made it difficult to get them care. Andy uh, taught with us at Maine Medical Center after I came there uh, for a while and I'm, anyway just very pleased that Jackie has put this together and that Tom Kibler and others have helped organize this and this, ser and this series on uh, emotional dysregulation I think is an, an important topic to a lot of us. We're all trained you know to make a diagnosis and that and then we open the book and we know what the treatment is well right from the start what what the heck is the diagnosis you know what is that what do we mean by emotional dysregulation how does that differ from uh, all of our kids having a bad day you know um, how, and might I have made that diagnosis with my grandson who's when he was three years old and having tantrums and now he's a highly functioning kid and kid off at college and doing doing just fine um, so, so how do we, it's a little uh, less clear to discriminate normality f the, in the bell-shaped curve of life uh, from what, what deserves or requires intervention. So what do we mean? Er, we're, when we say emotional dysregulation, dis we're often talking about what we call meltdowns, uh, severe irritability, sometimes it takes the form of anxiety attacks, it can seem like it's attention-seeking behavior, that, the tantrum in the supermarket when you, when you won't buy the uh, candy bar at the checkout uh, lane and, or, or mood swings. Uh, but now when do we decide and how do we decide whether we should look further about whether an intervention or guidance is necessary or just reassure a parent, oh, this, is, this is fine, you know, kids, kids, get, kids get upset sometimes. When is it more than that? Um, so is this a diagnosis or a specific disorder or is it a non-specific state that can derail uh, the relationships in the family, school, peers, and future development? Uh, is it a state that indicates risk for serious, long-lasting, impairing mental illness? Um, so that's the general issue we want to start off with and I'm going to say almost nothing specifically about treatment today. Uh, coming up soon, uh, later this year, uh, August and October, uh, Lindsay Tweed, who's here today, is going to talk about how this presents in children, pre in preschool and, and elementary school children, uh, and options for treatment in that age range. Uh, Casey Moss, who's also here, is going to talk about how this presents in adolescents. Uh, and um, both 
both are age ranges in which this, this is a serious problem. Now, uh, Deb is going to, Deb and Alyssa, who's not, Alyssa, are you here? No. <laughs> Maybe just uh, Deb, going to give us an illustration of what, um, what this is like. Uh, in, in, and there are many different ways this can present. We'll talk about that as we go further. Then we're going to talk about assessment, differential diagnosis, some concepts about uh, etiology, where does this come from, uh, and what does that suggest about what we should be doing about it. Deb, you want to say something about your case? Sure. I'll, I'll talk about my um, three-year-old that um, Whitney knows, I think. Um, well, she does know. Um, <laughs> so this was a three-year-old that one of our nurse practitioners in the clinic had seen and then asked me to see them as well uh, for not sleeping. And I apologize for like microscopic prints. I should have had people bring binoculars. Um, but uh, the child was not sleeping, um, was having e extreme tantrums, and the parent was concerned because she didn't seem to feel pain when she would fling herself around the house, um, get into things, fall off of things. She was in constant motion, um, and she could have um, these big tantrums where she would pull out her own hair, sometimes bite herself. And the other thing the mom was very um, notable about this child was that she was very precocious with her language, developed language very early, and was able to start to read books at three back to the mom. Um, and so uh, she had an unremarkable pregnancy, um, and there was no history of substance use during the pregnancy. And um, I'm going to stand next to you, Doug. Um, so th there was an, it was an unremarkable pregnancy, and there was no history of substance use. The other thing that th um, was really concerning about this child was the child's weight. She was well, she was th at three, she was well above the 95th percentile for her age. There was no preschool available. The, the, the mom could not leave the house because of the child's uh, severe tantrums when she went in anywhere. She was really isolated and alone. She couldn't play with other kids because of issues with sharing and rage. The mom was completely sleep deprived. The child would be up hourly at night and the one thing that would give them a few minutes of sleep was if the mom fed her at night, which likely led to some of the issues with the, the weight gain. What would happen and give the mom and the dad a little bit of rest was the maternal grandmother would come step in and watch the, the child for um, one night a week so the parents could get some sleep. And then there was a, the paternal grandparents lived across the street and the paternal grandfather was extremely critical, particularly of the mom and her parenting styles and how she was trying to cope with this young lady. There was a family history of ADHD and alcohol use disorder on the dad's side. And they had tried using time out to try to regulate this, this youngster when she, a lot of triggers for this is it would be if she wanted something and she didn't get it, they tried t time out. The feeding at night gave her a little bit of them, a little bit of sleep. And mom said when they did try some routines, um, thing when, when the day was structured a little bit, things were a little bit better for her. So they started to work with Whitney. They also saw endocrinology to um, help assess for um, syndromic causes of um, and her elevated BMI. And then we talked a little bit about neurology, but really when, we, when it came down to it, I, I don't think she was paying attention and there wasn't a lot of reinforcement of some of her injuries from flinging herself around. Um, and, no. and, and then we referred her to CDS and talked about uh, developmental pediatrics evaluation. And then I'll stop there. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I, and I can say more, but I'll stop there. Yeah. Okay. Take it. okay. <laughs> This is a good illustration of how complex, how messy uh, these, these situations become. And I don't think any of us would say this is just fine and dandy, just uh, don't, parents are overreacting to normal childhood you know, misery and, and uh, ups and downs. Uh, and there's a lot of reason to be worried about the future for this, this, this girl. What's she gonna be like as a teenager? What's she gonna be like as a young adult? Uh, is she headed for a lifetime of a a lot of trouble. In terms of adolescence, 
that's another period when you know things really go off the rails. And often, often kids have been relatively okay, or maybe they've had difficulties earlier on, but then as they hit early adolescence and puberty and the social pressures and defining their, their identities in all different respects and their competencies and their relationships with parents are shifting to over to uh, attachments to the peer group and identifying maybe with the peers you wish they wouldn't identify with and so on. Lots of things, as we know, become manifest at that point. I just want to start with some general treatment principles. And this is, again, kind of contrary, running against the grain of the idea that we we do our assessment, we have a, a diagnosis, and that leads to treatment, and everybody lives happily ever after. And it's just not that neat and tidy. And I think we should pay attention, but not be totally distracted by provisional diagnoses um, or sub-threshold diagnoses. When somebody has most but not all of the symptoms of ADHD, major depressive disorder, and anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive traits, on and on. Um, that's important information. That doesn't necessarily mean there's a linear connection from that observation to, the, to a treatment outcome based on what we, the, the, our treatment uh, randomized controlled trials with people who are a decade older uh, and maybe a different animal, you know. But nevertheless, it's important information. And so if you do have what looks pretty much like ADHD, but not exactly, and maybe there's some other things, like there's certainly in Deb's case, uh, that, this, that could be a part of this. And it's interesting that the issue of not, not or maybe sensation deficiency with pain is just distraction and being preoccupied with other things. Maybe, she's, maybe ADHD is part of the picture. It's not the whole picture. Nevertheless, the treatment effect for stimulant meds with ADHD, the first line treatment, is r remarkable and positive. The harm you can do is pretty limited, uh, is quite limited. Uh, you, if the, the side effects of the ADHD meds are generally quite visible. Get not sleeping, not eating. Um, is it getting more agitated instead of more settled? Uh, that suggests a, a, a thoughtful and well-observed trial is a worthwhile thing to do, and you might might hit a home run. And things might settle down remarkably. Uh, the second thing, so other than diagnosis, though, is thinking about what are the symptoms and, and behaviors that are really getting in the way of the, of the function of the child or teenager, uh, the relationships, uh, and development. And I think, for instance, of an eight-year-old I worked with recently, um, very bright kid, very solid family, wonderful people. Um, you couldn't ask for more competent, caring parents. Uh, and this kid going absolutely ballistic at night in a way that smacked of an anxiety disorder. Uh, but it's like night terrors times 100. Um, and one of the things that really worried me and lent to me uh, a certain urgency about it all was what this was doing to his relationship with his parents. As they were becoming more and more sleep deprived, they were getting furious with the kid. They were losing it. They were getting emotionally dysregulated. Uh, I found myself wondering, when I hear about the boy being thrown on the couch by dad, when does this cross the, because dad is losing it and he's got to work. And uh, both, of, both of them were hardworking, full-time employed people, very bright. Uh, but dad was border, bordering on being abusive. And the, ki the content of the kid's uh, terrors about monsters coming to kill him in the night was maybe the monsters are my dad, or maybe it's both of my parents. Um, so anyway, I was worried about a real poisoning of the well of, of family relationships, you know, in an otherwise really well-functioning family, and a sibling doing fine. Uh, so. That sort of ramped up my sense of urgency to get this under, under control um, and has gone very well. We talk more about that case if you want. Um, another thing, too, is that many of the things that we know how to do and that are effective and that have shown effectiveness in very careful, rigorous trials uh, in child and adolescent behavioral health uh, 
have effects that cross diagnoses. It's not like, okay, I see the uh, diplococcal uh, organism and, that, uh, and he's got a cough and he's got a fever, so I know which antibiotic to use. It's specific to what's going on with John Smith, and he gets better. M much of what we do works across diagnostic groups. So what does that mean? Uh, it's carefully tested. It's not, that's not just a function of sloppy thinking. Uh, but for starters, uh, you know, the SSRI medications treat lots of different things. You know, they treat depression, they treat anxiety, and under those categories, there are a huge number of different permutations. So uh, a lot of what we do is transdiagnostic in its effect, and a lot of the interventions that you'll hear more about from Lindsay uh, in August and Casey have to do with work help support, supporting family environments, uh, supporting parent-child relationships, and the studies that have been done on these that show these are effective, clinically effective, cost effective, um, are, don't have outcomes limited to any one diagnosis. So we'll talk more about that because that kind of goes against the training, the, the, the grain of much of what we've been trained. So what about a differential diagnosis? Nevertheless, even though it has its limitations, um, it is valuable to know whether or not the person does, the kid, does fit into any of these concepts that we've learned about because they do have meaning. Like I said, if, like if Deb's case has 80% of the criteria of what we'd think about with ADHD, even though there are other things too, might it be that the medication, the treatment, and the parent guidance that goes with that would be helpful? I want to talk about pediatric bipolar disorder. There's been enormous controversy about that. I think concern, I'd say not just a concern, a finding that we were, we as a field were over-diagnosing that following some papers in the 90s and that it's not as big of a problem as we would think, but I want to talk about that. That led really to the invention of a new diagnosis because this category of this mood dysregulation wasn't well captured by some other things. Uh, and that's this new diagnosis of DMDD, dysphoric mood dysregulation disorder. We'll talk about that. Um, I particularly want to talk about those first three, but there's also the issue about uh, in child temperament. Uh, and I'll talk less about these points, uh, and, and, but we'll have plenty of time in the Q&A if we want to go into that more. Um, I mentioned just in passing, well, we'll as, I, as we go along, we'll talk about all of this. Um, Thinking about adolescence, the Developmental Disorders Unit at Spring Harbor Hospital came into being because, I'm mean, simplifying here a little bit, uh, autistic kids go off the rails often when they become adolescents. So the kid who's not talking, doesn't relate well to others, is in special ed, needing a lot of help, maybe quite impaired, but he's, he's manageable when he's eight when he's 13 and 14 and as big as his mom and almost as big as his dad, uh, and the intensity duration of his uh, tantrums when things are not going away in a way that he can understand uh, is more is getting worse. He's now not, not manageable. And kids go into residential treatment, hospitals, and the development of disorders unit was a step to try to can we figure out what's going on with many of these kids and keep them at home and keep them on the developmental track? It's a bit of a Which, by the way, Andy Cook was instrumental in uh -huh. um, working with um, Maine Med and development. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And Andy was Lindsay's predecessor as the uh, medical director for the Office of Child and Family Services in DHHS, and that's a hugely important role. Um, and then we're going to talk uh, fetal alcohol syndrome spectrum disorder can uh, manifest this way. I'm in traumatic brain injury, a, a kind of secondary or acquired ADHD uh, is one way that, that traumatic <laughs> brain injury may manifest itself. Um, some kid who clearly didn't have it before they got hit, whacked in the head in the car accident, and now clearly looks, smells, and feels like ADHD or mood liability. And you're wondering, is this a bipolar kid? 
and I wasn't wondering that a, a, a year ago. Um, and often I didn't know him a year ago, so I, I'm kind of not so sure. You know, if it were, maybe it was there, we were missing it. Anyway, uh, but then the none of the above, but it's still a syndrome causing distress, conflict, and, and likely ongoing impairment. What about ADHD? A quick and, uh, quick and messy history is you go back and look at what was it, how was ADHD thought of around the time I was in medical school and prior. And terms were used like hyperkinetic syndrome, minimal brain dysfunction. Uh, and then that got winnowed down to a more definable, specific diagnosis that we call ADHD. And the winnowing down was that, well, some of these kids do have huge meltdowns, out emotional outbursts, they're irritable all the time, they get depressed. Uh, and that's important. Um, some of, the, some, one bad outcome with ADHD in adolescence is sometimes the depression becomes more apparent and suicide happens. That, that's a, a very real possibility. So, this was always in the mix of what was being discussed, but what was pathognomonic, you know, that's the key word. What, what, what was absolutely specific and tightly linked to, are you going to be making that diagnosis again five years ago, and we'll still describe this individual or 10? And the answer was no, because many people with, had core symptoms of ADHD, of impulsivity, overactivity, you know, uh, inattention, of course. Um, didn't have that. So it got taken out of the diagnosis. And then here we are at Mass General Hospital in a huge, very carefully run uh, ADHD clinic uh, doing very good research on ADHD. And there's this subgroup who are off the charts in terms of the meltdown variable. And guess what? So are their relatives. So you start, and, and the idea comes up, could this be early bipolar disorder? And um, um, so it got sort of added back in as a, uh, add, it's, it's, now the kid has, has comorbid ADHD with maybe m pediatric mania. So we'll talk more about that reality, but the point is this is not really a new concept that ADHD uh, uh, can be associated with this. And it's, and it's very important because this is a huge issue for man management uh, and treatment and parent guidance. Let me just say a word or two about the Vanderbilt uh, assessment scale that we all know and use. It's really a very good tool. It, it's on one lousy piece of paper. It doesn't take long. Parents can do it. Teachers can do it. Um, and it, it's broken down into sections. It's not just a total score. The total score is meaningful. But you, a classic, classic ADHD kiddo is going to be full of high scores on, the, on items one through nine. He's gonna be inattentive, distractible, uh, disorganized, he loses his hat, he doesn't, he's talking to other people in school, teacher says he's too social, uh, he, he, you know, you can't stay on the same topic for more than, you know, a millisecond. Okay, he's, he's got ADHD. And he may have the, over, the overactive or hyperactive subtype, or the inattentive, uh, or what we call predominantly inattentive, which is not without much overactivity. Girls are more likely to have a lot of, with ADHD, a lot of this, and maybe less of the overactivity. Uh, and he may or may not have impulsivity. You may, truck can't wait your turn. Uh, you know, get frustrated and you grab something. Um, these are more optional, <laughs> but, uh, but, but important, and they often go along with it. But uh, arguing temper, Def openly defying things, oppositional behavior often develops, uh, gets getting into fights, stealing things, um, lies, he's cruel. Um, these these are, are less central, but need to be noted. If they're there, they're gonna probably, they, they may require additional management with uh, parent, parent guidance, parent support, school support at school and may or may not settle down as the ADHD comes under control if you have somebody who responds well to the medication. So um, that's just one example of, of using a tool in a way to kind of fine tune what we're dealing with. 
What about pediatric bipolar disorder? I don't want to spend too much time on this, but again, that's sort of the history issue uh, that kids with intense emotion irritability and agitation were thought to have early bipolar disorder or pediatric mania. And, you know, back up just a couple of decades, uh, we're all quite enamored of the fact that adult bipolar disorder is often terribly destructive and very treatable. Uh, if people will just stay on their lithium. Yeah. And, and if they are blessed with being lithium responsive, which many people are, and many, some, not, not everybody. But so, so there's a lot of interest in this. Secondarily, a, a factor that sort of fanned the interest in this is my kid's impossible. My, my father-in-law, in Deb's case, is telling me I'm the worst mother in the world. And if I just had a brain, my kid wouldn't have any trouble, right? And now, I bring him to see Dr. Robbins, and he says my kid has, has a juvenile bipolar disorder. Well, that's a, that's a genetically based, biologically based disorder. So I guess that's not my fault, you know? So it relieves guilt enormously. I'm being a little simplistic, very simplistic here. <laughs> but um, people latch on to a diagnosis that, that has, or there's some familiarity. And also the idea of earlier intervention, we're all for that, and here, uh, you know, maybe we can get on top of this earlier in this child's life and prevent the life of misery that, that might go with that, that diagnosis. This spawned some really, really good research of, at NIMH and elsewhere about understanding mood regulation by uh, Ellen Liebenluft and Daniel Pine, among others, who have written wonderful things about this. And there's a, a child psychiatrist named Gabriel Carlson who's semi-retired now. She'll probably still be semi-retired when she's 200 years old. And children ever going to stop it. Very smart, tiny little lady, weighs about 20, 25 pounds. But <laughs> um, very bright, very logical. If you ever have a chance to hear her speak at a meeting, she's worthwhile. Anyway, the, so, some of all this is that it's critical to distinguish whether this is a trait or characteristic of the child that's there pretty much all the time. Getting irritable, easily upset, uh, easily triggered into meltdowns as opposed to truly episodic, that between uh, February, you know, March, April, May, he was fine. And then there came a period of several months or we weeks or months when the least thing set him off and, and he was revved up and so on. In a nutshell, one of the core features of bi bipolar disorder at any age is that it's episodic. It comes and goes, it waxes and wanes. That's not, that's, a, that's too, also there, there's a, you can always think of an exception when we treat the people who are not getting better who are usually the ones that come to the psychiatrist. We see a lot of people who don't fit the rules. But uh, the kids with a more episodic irritability maybe have early bipolar disorder, maybe. Um, but what we're talking about here really is with emotional dysregulation is a characteristic of the child that's there pretty much all the time. Um, now, so there, anyway, enough about that, but we'll come back to that. But the key issues that sort of sort out what is really early or at any age uh, bipolar disorder is the presence of mania with, with the symptom of grandiosity. You can be mis Many people are miserable in this world. Not that many people get elated, grandiose, and are working on their great ideas at four in the morning, on and on and on, until they crash into depression. Um, the dysregulation we're talking about in terms of emotional dysregulation is more a persistent characteristic of the child. Um, and one problem, uh, fallout with this, is as they were recognizing that uh, that this was a little bit different from uh, the, the same group that was working on this in, in Boston. Uh, they were coming to the conclusion that, gee, one thing that's unique about pediatric bipolar disorder is it doesn't respond to any of the medications that help adult bipolar disorder. They all need atypical antipsychotics. And that was one factor in a huge boom in the use of risperidone and other atypical antipsychotics. And there's an element of, of very legitimate value to that. Uh, there's a, there's a well-grounded FDA indication for uh, risperidone 
uh, with uh, severe irritability and aggression in autism, and that's true of some non-autistic non uh, children, but it comes with a price, weight gain and uh, you know, all, the, all the baggage that the antipsychotics go with, extra pyramidal signs, risk of tardive dyskinesia, which in, does in fact happen with kids. Um, a uh, wonderful body of work has been by Anne Duffy in Canada, Canada, and this is Gabriel Carlson, um, uh, longitudinal study of offspring of people with adult, uh, with, with bipolar disorder, which is a very high level of heritability, and tracking these and seeing as they went in, went from childhood to adolescence to adulthood, they're now, her, her cohort's got to be in their 40s now. Um, uh, when people first had, you know, what, what did they look like when they were first ill with their bipolar disorder? It was not that pediatric mania concept. Almost nobody had that. They, when they were first ill, it was depression, and it typically happened in adolescence. So that's like if we're trying to look to snuff out bipolar disorder early, pediatric bipolar disorder mania is not a useful thing. Nevertheless, catching it in adolescence is very important. Uh, su the suicide risk is, is substantial. Uh, the, now it's, was, when I was in training, this was really not recognized. Um, and um, now if you go over to Spring Harbor Hospital or any psychiatric hospital, you don't have to look far. You're going to find uh, uh, not, not a lot, but some patients with uh, bipolar disorder that's manifested in, in adolescence. Um, and, um, and they are at risk for re a severe recurrent lifelong illness. It's very si significant. And I should just, my little personal side, effect, side, side, side story on this. When I was a child psychiatry fellow, this is at the University of Colorado, which is a suburb of Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. uh, the, um, we had a, a girl come into the emergency room uh, who was normally a well-behaved, nice kid, lots of friends, um, stable family, um, uh, and she was had been not sleeping for week, for many days. She was hypersexual. She was calling up boys. Uh, she was. I didn't witness this, uh, and fortunately, it was before things were being videotaped. Uh, she was dancing on the exam table and throwing her inter underpants in the face of the intern who was sent in to check her out. You know, and her parents were like, oh my God, what's going on here? And uh, she got on the public address system of her high school and said, there's a party at my house tonight. Everybody come over. And, um, <laughs> and then, and then, then, then says, oh my God, where are they going to sit? So she calls up Acme Rental and orders a thousand chairs, <laughs> which are delivered to her driveway, <laughs> and her parents get the bill. So uh, anyway, and she and and the more you knew about psychiatry, the wronger you were. The person who was dead on was the pediatrician, who who knew the knew the kid, knew the family, and he said, "This looks like manic depressive illness to me." which was what we called bipolar disorder. And uh, the s wise senior fellow in the ER with the fresh out of school, uh, you know, child resident, uh, resident just started that summer, that would be the, I was the wise fellow who knew, who knew everything. But, oh, no, no, no. Uh, you know, the book says right here, onset of bipolar disorder around age 26. And so, no, it's not that. So maybe schizophrenia, maybe hysterical psychosis, who knows what the hell that is, you know. And uh, so we, and she got admitted, she got treated as though this was an agitated psychotic episode, which it, she was delusional in, in some ways. And she got drugged up on chlorpromazine, uh, stiff as a board and slurring. <laughs> She's a poster child for every reason not to use the old, old time antipsychotics, you don't really, really have to. Um, at some point, the little light bulb goes off in the head of the second year psych resident who's treating her. So again, the less you know, the better off you are. Uh, and he, he starts her on a trial of lithium, poof, she's better. 
and uh, it was really striking. So anyway, enough about my PTSD about <laughs> knowing having all the answers. Casey. <laughs> Yeah. The controversy, the controversy around that is that the one of the researchers during that early work uh, didn't adequately disclose funding from Johnson and Johnson who make resveratrol, and so um, the reason why I bring that up is obviously that's a really important. We have to be good consumers of science, right? And so um, just being kind of thoughtful about that, and then right now I think we have a lot of pediatric patients whose parents were kids during that time uh, uh -huh. and maybe inaccurately diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And so I think it's important that we know the history of these things. So when we take a family history and we have a parent say, I was diagnosed with bipolar when I was a kid, that might make you think the kid has you know, higher risk for bipolar disorder, but maybe it was more DMDD. So. That's right. Very, very good point. And the, the, the I, I'm very surprised that that physician remained employed by Harvard uh, and is now retired with all sorts of laudits and praise and so on about his wonderful career. He did good things, but anyway, that was really off the charts. Um, but and true, in, and, and just generally, and maybe uh, the, the term bipolar gets used very loosely for, every, it seems like everybody, every other family you talk to has somebody who had bipolar disorder. It means, well, he's, he's impossible. He argued all the time, beat up his wife, he's in jail. <laughs> he, he, substance abuse, la di da uh, Or uh, it overlaps with borderline personality disorder. So um, this, there are gender issues here. Uh, so that, that woman has bipolar disorder, maybe borderline, and she's just emotionally all over the place and impossible. Um, because he was very, very loosely. So, it takes, unfortunately, things take a little time, but to say, well, when Uncle John or Aunt Susie was ill, what were they like? And, and you don't have all day to talk to go into that in detail, but you get some sense of whether this feels like it's valid or not, because it, it's used very loosely. Um, so what, so to deal with this problem, that we have this emotional dysregulation issue, but we don't have a diagnosis for it, that research led to creating a diagnosis, which is this one, dysphoric mood dysregulation disorder, which we accepted into the DSM-5 in 2013. And these are the criteria, which are pretty well thought out. So severe temper outbursts, verbal or behavioral, three or more times per week, and families, in bad cases, this is often daily, outbursts happen re happening regularly for at least 12 months. So this is not episodic. This has just been going on as long as we can really clearly remember. Chronically irritable or angry mood most of the day, nearly every day. Trouble functioning doing to the, uh, due, due to this in more than one place. Home, school, peers. If a kid is having impossible sim symptoms of any kind but only at school, well, you got a learning disability? You know, is there something that makes that environment particularly distressing, challenging, and difficult? If it's only at home, and he's in a sweetheart at school. Is it something about relationships in the family? You know, I'm not, I don't want to jump to conclusions, but this, the context can make a difference. Is, is it with everybody uh, or in, in every place or just some? Uh, early, really, relatively early onset, you know, uh, diagnosed between ages six and 10, that's, people are reluctant to make major diagnoses earlier than six. I'd say as we know more about this, or we become more expertise about saying, well, what three-year-old is headed in this direction? Um, and, uh, but, but I think caution about the diagnosis earlier makes, is reasonable. Um, and uh, a big and important finding is, or a issue is how do people do over time? And this is a relatively new diagnosis, so there aren't a ton of longitudinal studies that have been going on for decades and decades. But from what they can figure out from the studies they've done, folks with this picture are at risk for a pretty unhappy life. Uh, they will continue to be mood dysregulated, depression, anxiety, um, which will impair relationships. Uh, it's going to make, make them be hard people to be uh, your parent, your spouse. Uh, 
they're going to have trouble in school, they're going to not do well in jobs, and they're going to get terminated from work. Uh, but notably, in what little they've seen about this, they were not looking like adult bipolar disorder. So from a offspring of bipolar disorder who developed bipolar disorder, did they look like this? The answer is no. If they look like this, followed out into adulthood, do they have bipolar disorder? No. So these are really not the same thing. Um, uh, treatment, and I'm going to say less about this than Lindsay and uh, Casey will, uh, but just in general terms, uh, for particularly adolescents, DBT uh, can be very helpful. It helps you learn a language of understanding your affect. Uh, psychotherapy can actually be very helpful. The, the boy I talked about where I was worried about the dad throwing him around and he was really losing it and so on, we, uh, a, an excellent therapist in, in Yarmouth, um, Ellen Smith Herb, she's only part time, so it's probably hard getting your patients in there. There are too few, there are too few tra trained therapists in this world. Uh, she's uh, an excellent one. And she started off with him, helping him just develop a language for, for his emotions. And, and, and he's a bright kid, and high IQs help everything, and, he, and he's a bright kid, and that helped. But she helped him sort of put, a, put words to what he's experiencing, and that le helps lead to a certain degree of mastery. Okay, now I need to know how do I keep that, that anxiety or w being scared of the monsters or whatever. How do I get that under control without doing it, trying to get it under control in a way that makes me have a fight with my mom and dad? So you know, getting a language that worked for him uh, was very helpful. And at any age, I, this is sort of, I think one of the non-specific meaningful issues about family, about psychotherapy is developing a language for your own internal experience and bringing, this is, now I'm sounding like Sigmund Freud, but some of the things you weren't really conscious of, being more mindful about. So am I Freud or am I Buddha? I don't know. A little of both. <laughs> um, uh, par specialized parenting techniques. And Lindsay, you, you had a good expression the other day, uh, a few weeks ago, that we talked about parent management training, that which is a, an evidence-based way of helping parents with severely oppositional or aggressive children by and large, which is very helpful. The term parent management kind of impl implies you, you're not doing parenting right. You, you said, and a better way to think about it is training in some specialized parenting techniques that this kid needs and that that kid doesn't need. My eight-year-old example, his sister's doing fine. And it's not because his, her, he has, she has different parents. Uh, they're reasonable, caring people with both kids. And um, he pushes buttons and touches off the dynamite with, <laughs> but in a way that she does not. Uh, anyway, so um, helping parents understand what's going on, uh, de-escalating. And I have to just emphasize because, uh, the parents need help themselves recognizing their level of frustration uh, and, and anger. These parents, I didn't realize I'd be talking about this, this boy so much, but it was a good example. They were intensely ashamed of their own behavior. Only after they trusted me a little bit did they tell me, let, let it, uh, we don't like how, how much we're losing it at 2 in the morning. You know, I don't like that. That's not who I want to be. That's not who I want to be to my kid. Uh, and that's not... I'm not, that's not, you know, just not okay. <laughs> and they were, they were ashamed of it and uh, so on. And uh, fortunately, they were, didn't take a lot for them. They were already thinking that. But sometimes uh, people are not that conscious of how, just how enraged they're getting. And if you are enraged, sleep deprived, frustrated, being criticized by your, your mother-in-law, your father-in-law uh, about what a terrible parent you are, guess what? You don't learn these things very well about how, how to manage a kid in a patient way. You don't learn anything. You just want to react. So 100% of the time, I'm being very black and white, uh, when you bring up the issue, let's not talk about behavioral planning for your kid with this behavior problem or emotional dysregulation problem. Oh, we tried that and it doesn't work. Well, what did you try? And what you hear is a chaotic history of punitive behavioral responses. 
And beha behavior things don't work. You can punish him until the cows come home. He did, he's numb to it. I could, uh, I could take away his bike. I could not let him go see his friends. I could pound on his head with a two by four. It will not change his behavior. And unfortunately, Homo sapiens doesn't do particularly well with aversive re conditioning. We get angry. We don't necessarily learn from it. We get mad at the person who's taking away our bike. Uh, and so it adds fuel to the, to the fire. Uh, so again, helping parents tune in is really, really critical. And this, this therapist I'm talking about with this case didn't spend a lot of time with the parents, uh, but did spend some time helping them just take a breath, look at how they're reacting, and think of how, do, how can we deal with this in a way that won't burn us out quite so badly. Um, first of all, get over the shame about talking about it, at least in my office. You don't have to tell everybody at work about throwing your kid around at 4 in the morning. But uh, we can talk about this and problem solve how to do it. Like they, they started briefly. This didn't have to go on very long because it was keeping them up all night. They would sleep to some extent in shifts. <laughs> uh, if he comes in after 3 in the morning, Mom will take care of it, and Dad will sleep, or, and earlier the other way around, something like that. Now, uh, what about meds? There is no medication that is indicated by the FDA for lots of things, <laughs> uh, but uh, certainly not for this. So we think about stimulants for ADHD, SSRI may help, irritability, anger, certainly if there's anxiety associated. Um, uh, some, uh, there's a, been a, a small trial of uh, an SSRI, so Talipram, and methylphenidate for this diagnosis. It's too small to be really meaningful, but it, it, it looked very promising. Um, atypical antipsychotics can help irritability and aggression in autism, and uh, for others as well, they care baggage of all the side effects, so we want to not do that unless we really, really have to. A medication that's talked a lot about, and Lindsay may say more about this, is lamotrigine, lamictal. Uh, which uh, is uh, in, in, insufficiently studied as a mood stabilizing agent. It has an FDA indication for treating depression in people with bipolar disorder. Um, it's, uh, it, we did a, a small study at MAIMED on this, uh, basically just showed that you could use it safely without getting into Stevens Johnson syndrome, and liver failure, and so on, which can definitely happen. Uh, if you don't go very slowly with the dose. But um, it was too small to really no, note the effect. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's an open question. Th this is a very good review. There's, uh, there's a ton of references at the end, and I don't want to uh, get too far behind here. I'm going to say just briefly some things about some other stuff. Oppositional defiant disorder is very common uh, in the world, <laughs> in kids. Um, it, we worry about it being a precursor to other behavior disorders, conduct disorder, or even to antisocial personality disorder. The vast majority of children with conduct, with oppositional defiant disorder, don't go down that path. It's very, uh, uh, very responsive to support supports to parents. And what that what, that, what I was talking about, parent management training, uh, uh, is is quite effective but engaging the parents, helping them get pragmatic about what they're doing. Like if you're going to reinforce, practice catch him being good, See, he's ne and, the, and the next thing out of their mouth will be, he's never good, you know? He's horrible all the time. <laughs> and he was born yelling at me, you know? <laughs> uh, and uh, so, uh, no, at some point in 24 hours, there were five minutes when he was okay. Reward him for that. Comment on it, and that will grow. You know, so catch, have your eye binoculars tuned and your radar tuned for uh, finding things that you can. Re when he didn't hit his sister, when he played cooperative, you know, good, you're, Johnny, you're playing so nicely with with Mary. You know, so anyway, I'm being simplistic, but again, that doesn't happen if you're enraged at a kid. But it's very effective. Um, Temperament is a very old concept, which is very valid. Uh, the, and there's a reference in here to one of the earlier early studies by uh, Chess, Chess, Birch, and Thomas, Michael Rudder. Is in that, in that one. A anybody who ever had a kid realizes that kids are quite different. 
and their kids are easy to take care of. They smile, they respond, they learn. They, you say no, don't do that, and they don't, they don't do it. <laughs> uh, and um, there are other kids who are kind of shy, uh, inhibited socially, inhibited to unfamiliar circumstances. Um, the difficult, I don't know why the parenthesis got there. Um, kids who are none of the above, uh, who, are, who are just cantankerous, ornery, <coughs> ornery, difficult. And there are many, many different sub subdivisions about this. Somebody who's really articulate about this is the head of child psychiatry in Vermont now, UVM, Rob Altoff. He sent some really good studies on this. But many people have. It's very, it, so the difficult child, negative mood, withdrawal, low adaptability, high intensity, low regularity, unpredictable. You never know what's going to work with him. Um, the concept that came out of this is the sense of how well it fits with the parent's personality. And so goodness of kit, fit and bad. Some parents will be a wonderful parent to a kid who is A, B, or C, but not to the other. <laughs> He'll be to, but, and, and do, do well with one kid and, and, and not so well with another. Uh, if, and if parents can tag team and, and support each other, or, uh, I know he touches your buttons more than he touches mine. Can we kind of be mindful of that and tune in? That's, that's very valuable. This is a, an overview from the AAP that's re really useful, I thought. Um, but the idea of mismatch of fit, or the absence of a goodness of fit, helping a parent tune into, this is, this, this, he isn't doing this to drive me crazy. He's, doing, he's just wired up a little bit differently from his sibling. Let me appreciate that and anticipate where he might have trouble and so on. TBI, tra Jeff Max, I have to brag about this, he's a fellow of ours when I was at Brown at Bradley Hospital, is, has really focused his career on traumatic brain injury in children, uh, and there's a reference of his in the, in the references, which I, I think is really very good. One of the things that can happen is affective instability, and I also mentioned secondary ADHD. Somebody who you know has not had ADHD and now really looks like they've got ADHD. Uh, that, that's one of the pictures you see following a brain injury. Other things too, uh, they can become more oppositional, all, kind of all, all, the whole gamut there. And one of the interesting findings from this stu stuff is the brain injury, there, there, there are some correlations with neuroanatomy, you know, what, what part of the brain had trouble. And I mentioned some of that. Uh, but there are also associations with sub-threshold symptoms the kid might have had before that have now become exacerbated and with family history. So it may be ampling, amp, amping up somehow uh, latent problems that really weren't at the level of being problems yet. And yet the distinction can be quite, quite marked. Uh, in some cases, um, in, and this, this has to do probably with plasticity in children and adolescents, this self-corrects in time, not always. Uh, and. Uh, there are instances in which uh, a year or two, and, and in a time span of not days or weeks, but more like many months to years, the kid gradually comes back to who they were. Uh, I think, there's, again, this is speculation about plasticity and youth, and that it's, and this is less probably, almost certainly less likely with older, older folks, uh, older people. Um, what about, is, if your kid is like this dysregulated mess, meltdown kid, uh, is he going to be mentally ill forever and ever? Um, and this is a precursor to other things. And one good example of trying to tease that out is uh, some work being done in Maine by Dr. Kristen Woodbury, psychologist with the peer program. And she's done uh, work, uh, started at Boston Children's, which she was uh, at Harvard uh, on uh, identifying early risk for psychotic disorders, and that's primarily schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and what, what, what are the reasons to be concerned. Now, usually this is manifesting in mid to later adolescence. Uh, but uh, this, is a, a rare, a, this is her website, uh, and there's a screening process of initial screening, triage to someone who's trained about what to look like and then work on engaging the individual or, or child if uh, that's the problem. So, uh, and this clinical high risk 
for psychosis syndrome, this is sort of sub-threshold psychosis, or pretty much any symptoms, but with a first degree relative with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or psychotic depression. Uh, while it's not a linear predictor, predictor uh, about 22% of those people will develop a psychotic disorder within a year, about a third of them will within two to three years. That still means two thirds won't. So we don't want to predict doom and gloom for this individual, but we should be actively monitoring um, and, and supporting them with whatever sphere, domain of trouble they're having trouble with. Um, so this is, I think, very interesting, very useful. And then other things, PTSD, personality disorder, autism for sure, and as I mentioned, this is a reason many autistic kids essentially exceed what their families and schools capacity to manage them. Uh, fetal alcohol syndrome uh, is an important way this can develop. Um, so what about none of the above? And I want to just take a little time to talk about sort of the none of the above <laughs> idea. When we really don't, it doesn't fit a diagnosis well. We, we need to build to, make, to exist as providers in the world. Uh, and if somebody has most of the criteria of something, I'm comfortable with making a provisional diagnosis. And I tell the parents, um, this um, isn't absolutely for sure. And parents, let, let, I would, I as a parent would want certainty. I, I don't want to hear that I'm not that the doc isn't sure. But it looks mostly like most like a kind of depression, ADHD, whatever. Uh, I would use that diagnosis, and that may guide treatment, the first treatment steps and exploration of whether or not it works or not. This is, even when you don't have a clear diagnosis, it is significant, because I, like I say, follow-up shows these people having a lot of trouble. And if there's impairment, we're warranted in trying to explore. It's, we're not doing them a service to say, I don't see a diagnosis, he or she is fine, go home and relax, everything's going to be okay some degree of watching, watchful monitoring. Often watchful waiting, as we learn about it in medical school, is kind of benign neglect. Uh, I'm gonna ignore it, and if it, come, if it comes back to bite us, then, then it'll be worse, and then we'll know what to do. But that's waiting until it, things have deteriorated. Um, what, what can we say about how you get here, and etiologies, and of course this is a huge issue. Many, many, mental illnesses have, have heritable components. There's a wonderful set of studies done with the healthcare registries in Denmark and other uh, Scandinavian countries, the UK, and Germany, Switzerland. Uh, this has been well demonstrated that there are hugely her heritable factors in most mental illnesses. And I should say too, what gets inherited isn't the whole package of Bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or ADHD you may have some characteristics, and it may be only if you are the unfortunate person in which multiple of those single nucleide poly polymorphisms come together uh, that then you're ill. So much of what is inherited is, is essentially silent or not visible to the family. So I'm only getting a piece of the picture when I said that anybody in your family had mental illness. Well, that's when it it's kind of come together like a rogue wave in the ocean and it's become visible and it's been disruptive. In all of us, we have genes percolating around that are not causing a lot of trouble that if we happen to match up with the right person, maybe there'll be a problem. Or if there's a, if there's a gene by environment interaction, that genetic profile and certain environmental stresses might make for trouble. So uh, anyway, there's a lot of heritability, but and there's also fascinating mind-bending studies with ends of like 90,000 sub, uh, subjects in, 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 in Europe uh, that find that some of the most common genetic abnormalities, the SNPs and seeing the genome-wide association studies, are actually the same in all these disorders. Holy cow. You know, now, when you get later in life, they look very, very different. Uh, but, so what's going on there? Are the, is that environment? Whatever. Psychosocial experience is very important. And there's a fascinating study in Finland 
where they were looking at kids who were, had a strong family history of schizophrenia, where things were bad enough that they were adopted by somebody else. And then they looked at the outcomes and the primary driving factor in who was ill in early adulthood, irrespective of their being at risk for schizophrenia or not, was family conflict in the family they grew up in. So yes, there's a heritable thing. So the genetic study by Schultzinger and Rosenberg in Denmark that found when you look at adopted uh, offspring of people with schizophrenia who are adopted away from that family, their outcomes were associated with the genetic picture of, of who they were born, uh, uh, you know, created by. But that was only part of the picture. That whether that actually gets manifest is also determined by the family environment. So if that genetically vulnerable kid is adopted into a very stable family, they're going to do very well. And maybe if you go fishing for it, you might find some subthreshold symptoms of that disorder, but not, not striking. Um, another thing, uh, and this particularly comes from studies of children with a depressed parent, to, uh, it, the, the, the mood state and behavior of the parent, and, and, there's, and depression is hugely heritable. It's a very large heritable component to, to mood disorders in general. Bipolar, remarkably so, non-bipolar depression is less. Um, uh, number one, in, in a very good study by Bill Beardsley, uh, David Brent, and others, uh, uh, child scholarships, Boston, Pittsburgh, UC Life. Um, a good preventive intervention for offspring with a depressed parent so that they won't become depressed, which by and large was remarkably successful and very durable. A time limited intervention when these kids are between 8 and 13 is having positive effects. Fewer with a measurement of the number of days in the last 90 days when your function was impaired by mood symptoms markedly better in the kids from the families that they did this intervention called family talk. However, if the index parent, and these were all offspring of, of, of parents with depression, if the index parent was still depressed, no effect. You're wasting your time until you get mom or dad's depression under control. And of course they say, don't treat me, I brought him here to fix him. And I, you know, I, I, okay, my, my life stinks, but leave me alone. Uh, and I'll take my Zoloft and keep my mouth shut. But, well, that's not good enough. You know? um, so number one, the parent's mood is critical and the parent must be helped uh, or you're not doing anything. Second, even when the parent's depression is helped, the kid has a better chance, shot at getting better, but he's still likely to have trouble because we learn bad, be problematic behaviors when we're depressed all the time. And so we haven't attached well, or, you know, attachment is a complicated idea. But uh, it's impaired our relation, our parenting style with, with the kids. That's treatable. That's treatable. There's a wonderful version of the pediatric, you know, the, the pediatric mental health access program here in, in Maine, and that started with Sandy Fritch years ago. Uh, there's a version of that in Michigan. And my Sheila Marcus, who trained with us when I was at the University of Michigan. I take, I take credit for all the good things. Right <laughs> <laughs> None of the bad things. Um, and they have woven into this pediatric access program a very intensive support system for postpartum and other parental depression. Uh, because it's the pediatricians who see this. The, 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 the obstetrician who delivers your baby, he, do, he doesn't know. You're, but you show up for the well baby visit and, and, and see, you see the kid at a year of age and a lot of you The pediatrician's in a position to spot this trouble and to help it. And, and there, these are behaviors that once you help the parent become more aware of, more mindful of, um, it, things change. Things change enormously in a, in a positive way. So uh, it is nature and nurture. It's not one or the other. It's clearly both. 
just briefly, uh, I'm not going to talk about this too much because it's so interesting we could talk about it all day, is the interaction of, of experience and biology. And Michael Rudder had this term of the biological embedding of experience, adverse and positive. So positive experience early life, in early in life is like money in the bank for your future development. It will help you be more resilient and so on. Adverse experience early in life, eight high ACEs scores, you're in trouble. You have a different nervous system. If, you, if I got separated from my mother at the border in Texas and put in a cage for a few months, um, I am a different individual going forward. Now that can be, that's potentially treatable. I'd say in the real world it usually doesn't get treated, but it's treatable. Uh, epigenetic studies are fascinating. Uh, and this is how, how your, the function of your genome it is different based on some experience. Adverse experience, for one example, there are many examples, and this guy, Michael Meany, um, great things on YouTube, lectures on YouTube, fascinating stuff. Started with rats, applied very well to people. <laughs> um, uh, and an area I've been particularly interested in, is interested in, in HPF function and, and cortisol in depression in adolescence. Turns out adverse experience downregulates a particular hypothalamic glucocorticoid receptor so that you get overproduction of ACTH, you get persistent hypercortisolemia, you lose the di diurnal variation. You're just running around with the cortisol of a 80% uh, burn victim, you know. And that messes with your mood dysregulation big time. I should also say postpartum depression is associated with hypercortisolemia. So that is those little babies' brains are getting wired differently. So that's on top of whatever they got inher they inherited. It changes. So this is a change in, your, in the folding of the DNA molecule that allows for more expression of, the, 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 of that DNA. Um, and it's very important. And it's leading now to ideas about intervention that are very different from the psychopharm that we, we know about. And also, uh, is in, in some animal models, it's undoable by corrective experience. It's another story. It's fascinating. Um, also, it goes the other way. Your biology modifies your experience. If I have the biology of a major mental illness, my kids are more likely to have high ACEs because I will be dysregulated, I'll be a crappy parent, I'll be mean, I'll be nasty, I'll be irritable, I'll be grumpy, I'll be unemployed, we'll have to move every six months because I get fired and we get evicted, and, and so on. So downward social mobility with serious, serious mental illness, or I'm not in the home, I'm wandering around in Portland uh, panhandling at the intersections. Um, so the more poverty, exposure to violence, family conflict, and there's also a biological, very straight line biological thing, inflammatory cytokines, which, uh, and inflammation is, happens in many different ways. It can happen in secondary to mental illness, it can happen in secondary to physical illness. If you inject interleukin-6 into my brain, I will look like I've got depression. It, it makes things happen in your, your affective regulation. So uh, it goes really both ways, and we need to be open about that. Um, and just, I'm really running too long here, but I, I promise I'll shut up after this. Um, this is a new way of thinking about diagnosis, which is really that nonspecific symptoms precede specific mental disorders. Now, these disorders, here's psychotic disorders, bipolar, depression, personality disorders, substance abuse, and of course there are others. These come from observations late in the, in, the, in the course of illness. You know, a lot of these terms came from Emil Kaplan around the turn of the century. And he's looking at people who have been in, in the major state hospitals for decades, you know. And so, yeah, the bipolar people look this way, the people with schizophrenia look this way, clear categories. Now, back up a few decades, they didn't look that way. You know, people move from your asymptomatic at birth usually, <laughs> uh, and minor symptoms that could go in any direction. 
So the, and the colors line up. So let's see here, psychotic disorders is red. Well, here, here's a red dot over here uh, that's going to develop this way. Here's a blue dot that's going to develop that way. And it's because of other things that happen, whether this is pure, a purely a biological trajectory or a biology times environment trajectory. It evolves over time. And so the, the and, and in mo with essentially all of these things, getting involved earlier in the individual's life is more effective than later. If you want to back this up, we need to be treating people at, or before the diagnoses are clear cut. Um, so we could say if you're referred to our peer program because you have sub-threshold psychosis, the wrong thing for me to say is good news. You, we've carefully assessed your son. He does not have schizophrenia. Goodbye. You know, but some trouble was making him get referred to us. Let's help him with that. And we know that when we do that, we are decreasing the odds of it going in a bad direction. And there are countries around the world with national health systems, um, and let's not talk about the, el the election, uh, uh, that have put, put in place broad scale, Australia is one, sis uh, systems to support kids at this level. When, it, when they're nonspecific earlier, trouble with my girlfriend. I'm not. I'm procrastinating, and getting behind on my schoolwork, or I can't keep a job, or I'm fighting with my parents. None of that sounds like it's doom and gloom, horrible psych psychiatry. It sounds like normal adolescence. Well, let's help this kid with that. And if we do, and also the help is non-pharmacological, in almost all cases, it's cheap. Uh, you don't need a ton of training. <laughs> you need some, but. Um, but that, that's just stay tuned. There's going to be more about all that. Lastly, what interventions really do work, look up this website for a, an economist at the University of Chicago who has found that investment in health and education in early childhood is the best thing a society or a nation can do with its dollars. And I'm not going to get into are we ever really going to do anything about this. And that'll just leave us all hopelessly depressed. Um, and the next ones coming up are Lindsay and Casey, and thank you very much.